This video is sponsored by Masterworks. We've all heard of the dangers of nuclear power, the risk of meltdown, invisible but deadly radiation, memories of Chernobyl and Fukushima, an issue so pervasive it birthed the Grünen, the Green Party, one of Germany's largest political forces, with Green parties in general being staunchly anti-nuclear. Following the Russian invasion of Ukraine and the energy crisis, however, these positions have been increasingly questioned. The two disasters, indeed the two disasters most often brought up by anti-nuclear activists, are Chernobyl and Fukushima. These two precedents are used to paint a picture of the danger nuclear power plants pose. However, when looking at the facts, those concerns seem, if nothing else, exaggerated. Alarmist, even. Or do they? Is there merit to the criticism, and where does that put nuclear power in the middle of the energy crisis? About that, power costs have been hitting historic highs. As a result, we've seen a flurry of government action to try and rein things in. Now, normally, people's income from passive investments would help ease the pain of higher costs of living. But unfortunately, Goldman Sachs reports that a typical stock of a portfolio is expected to flatline at best this year. And so what do you do when inflation is making your savings a bad place to keep money as well? You could put your investments outside the stock market. No, not I say for a pillow. I'm talking real assets like fine art. According to Deloitte, 85% of wealth managers believe there's an argument for art as part of a wealth offering. Even Morgan Stanley specifically talks about fine art, saying, investment grade art has a low correlation to other major asset classes and after experiences lower price volatility. Numbers from Citibank show that contemporary art specifically has a negative 0.04 correlation to developed market equities, i.e. major stocks. Not only can it diversify your portfolio, it's had some stellar appreciation, even outpacing the S&P 500 for the last 26 years by 131%. And during times of crisis, it can actually appreciate even more. Contemporary art's appreciation spiked from 13.8% for the last 25 years to a whopping 25%. No wonder during our current crisis, Masterworks is seeing increased demand from investors looking to get contemporary art into their portfolios. Masterworks buys up an expensive art piece, then breaks it up into smaller, affordable shares through the SEC. You can read all the offering circulars at the SEC database linked in the description. Don't worry, this isn't crypto or NFTs. This is actual fine art from guys like Picasso and Banksy. Since having started out in 2017, Masterworks has been featured on TechCrunch, CNBC and Forbes, and they have over 650,000 users. To date, they've sold 9 paintings, and just in the last 3 months, Masterworks has returned 13, 17, 21, and 33% IRR to investors from the sale of 4 works respectively. Of course, past performance is no guarantee for future results, but that's still pretty incredible, especially in a year like 2022. Demand is high with the stock market still in turmoil, and paintings have sold out in minutes in the past. But my viewers can get priority access just by using the link in the description. Thank you for checking out Masterworks, as like this helps support what I do. And now, back to the video. So, the two examples cited by opponents of nuclear. Let's take a look at Chernobyl first. What happened there? First off, no, the exclusion zone is not stalker, there aren't any gigantic mutated animals or wondrous radioactive anomalies. The zone is, in fact, one of the best wildlife sanctuaries on the planet. There are wild horses, foxes, a whole lot of animals happily living in the area. Until the Russians arrived, anyway. And the zone itself was at no point abandoned, not even the nuclear power plant. After Block 4 exploded in 1986, Block 2 went on operating till 1991, Block 1 till 1996, and Block 3 all the way till 2000. But what about the radiation? To answer this question, I went and asked Thunderfoot, a PhD researcher and fellow YouTuber. He said, Radiation around Chernobyl is comparable to what you get on an airplane at altitude. The plane is more dangerous, though, due to the whole body dose. Most of the remaining Chernobyl radiation is cesium-137. Cesium in the environment isn't a great danger unless you eat it. So there you have it. Chernobyl is generally safe unless you go around eating the local soil and flora, just 36 years after the world's worst nuclear catastrophe. And this is where the alarmism, sensationalism, and people's general lack of physics knowledge intersect. Photos like this might look scary to the average Joe. Oh, what's this? A Chernobyl mushroom with one of them Genghis counters next to it. 21.88? That sounds mighty high, whatever that is. Nuclear power's bad. That picture is from Pripyat, the city right next to the power plant. The display shows 21.88 microsieverts, which equals 0 0.02 millisieverts, which is about one-fourth of the dosage you get on a transatlantic flight, which is 0.08. For the sake of perspective, a likely lethal dose would be 5,000 millisieverts, 65,500 times the radiation on transatlantic flights, and 250,000 times that of a Pripyat mushroom. It's not so scary when you put it that way, is it? The destruction of Chernobyl Block 4 itself is also a special case which nowadays couldn't happen in any developed country. Very briefly, the Chernobyl plant was running Soviet RBMK-1000 reactor which were cheap and easy to build and maintain, but this also entailed design flaws which were only corrected after the disaster. Basically the thing was very peculiar. And in order to avoid a runaway thermal feedback loop and potentially a catastrophe, you need reliable equipment and highly trained personnel. Neither of this was present in Chernobyl. On top of that, the Russian Empire, back then calling itself the Soviet Union, has always been notorious for cheaping out and suppressing inconvenient truths such as fatal design flaws in 
and their nuclear reactors, or more recently the actual state of the Russian armed forces. Ever since then, all remaining RBMK reactors have been retrofitted, meaning right now there isn't a single nuclear power plant on the planet which is able to explode like Chernobyl Reactor 4. Fair enough. But what about Fukushima then? Let's talk about that. The year is 2011. It's the 11th of March, quarter to 15. In one minute, the Tohoku earthquake would begin, just 72 kilometers off the coast, lasting for about 6 minutes. The good news is, it didn't happen right under the land. The bad news is, it was a magnitude 9 earthquake, the absolute top of the Richter scale. As it was underwater, it set off an enormous tsunami. Now, the nuclear power plant was right on the coast, but behind wave barriers. And right up to the tsunami, things were in order. Of the six reactors, only three were operating. The other three were shut down for inspections. When the earthquake hit, the three operational reactors shut down correctly as intended. However, coolant has to be circulated even after a shutdown, otherwise things can heat up and the reactor can melt down. Since the reactors no longer produced electricity, emergency diesel generators started running the coolant pumps. However, then the tsunami arrived, so large that it broke through the wave barriers and flooded the plant's basement where those generators were located. All generators failed with the exception of reactor 6s, providing enough power to cool both 5 and 6. The first 4, however, were left without coolant and melted down. There were also some hydrogen explosions, so if you see damage on the plant's buildings, it was that. Now you might be asking, how on earth did they not think of the tsunami risk, in Japan of all places, with a coastal nuclear power plant of all things? Why did they put the generators in the basement and how come they didn't know that wave barriers were insufficient for a large tsunami? And the answer is, they did know. The company operating the plant, TEPCO, has received warnings about the tsunami risk from the US Nuclear Regulatory Commission, various Japanese government committees, the Japanese Active Fault and Earthquake Research Center, and two separate in-house studies by TEPCO itself. They all came to the same conclusion. If there is a large enough tsunami, the plant's existing defenses will be wholly insufficient, resulting in a disaster. And TEPCO took all these studies and warnings and simply ignored them. Yep. If anything, this disaster has shown us how safe nuclear power plants really are, even in such an extreme environment. Since without decades of gross negligence and lack of oversight, the plant would have been fine even during a magnitude 9 earthquake and an enormous tsunami. The earthquake and tsunami killed 19,759, injured 6,242, with 2,553 missing. So how many people died due to the Fukushima nuclear disaster? One. Yeah. And if you look at the plant on a map, you'll see that the area around it is very much inhabited. People still live there. There is even a 7-Eleven just 1.5 kilometers away from the actual reactor blocks. As you can see, when you actually look at the facts, nuclear power, even nuclear disasters, are suddenly a lot less scary. However, this didn't stop Germany, for example, from trying to phase out its nuclear production from 2011 onwards, which resulted in the country's increasing dependence on Russian hydrocarbons, which ended up financing the imperialistic genocidal conquest of Ukraine. There was a parallel attempt at the so-called Energiewende, a large-scale shift towards green energy sources, but that initiative is now mired in German bureaucracy with no solution in sight. Thus, in order to plug the hole left by the nuclear phase-out, Germany had to resort to lignite, the dirtiest, most polluting, lowest quality type of coal there is. In addition, lignite is mined via open pit mining, turning the environment into an actual wasteland for multiple square kilometers. So there we go. We turn the entire regions into wastelands to burn the worst possible fossil fuel just so we can shut down those scary nuclear power plants. Meanwhile, in France, nuclear power constitutes three quarters of the energy mix with six new reactors planned in the next 15 years. Poland has also opted for nuclear to replace their notoriously polluting coal power plants. And good for them. There is nothing really wrong with nuclear, and opposition thereof originates either from a lack of knowledge or deliberate spread of sensationalist misinformation. You know, it's easy to report cesium levels exceeding the norm 100 million times when the norm is zero. And regarding nuclear waste storage, it's a pain in the ass, complicated and expensive, but by no means unsolvable and vastly preferable to dying from the climate catastrophe. Plus, turns out, the Chernobyl zone is perfect for large-scale nuclear waste storage, such a facility having been inaugurated a few months before the invasion. Nuclear energy should be the basis of every modern energy mix. It should be used as a stable backbone with renewable energy stacked on top. This is the surest, most effective way of getting rid of fossil fuels and achieving carbon neutrality in the energy sector. And if you still think nuclear plants are too risky, well, global warming is far riskier. So take your pick. Thank you for watching, this was my video about nuclear power. If you like my content, please consider supporting me on Patreon and otherwise like and subscribe, and I'll be seeing you later.